So we're thrilled that uh, he and, and this kind of editor's perspective can be here. I think it's a critical one that we don't hear from uh, nearly enough. Uh, Louise Leaf, who I've mentioned, is the deputy director of IRP since it was founded in 98. Um, uh, previously a practicing journalist at, at US News and World Report and a number of other areas that you can see there in the bio. <coughs> so been terrifically helpful to us to help uh, navigate that world. Uh, ben De La Cruz um, is an uh, Emmy Award-winning documentary video producer and reporter uh, for WashingtonPost.com, and um, we'll see some of that work, and uh, it's a real thrill, and some former fellows here at the center of being part of that. Um, uh, it, it's a terrific, a terrific tie-in, and it's, it's terrific to have been here. And finally, Paul Hendry is a commerce and industry editor at Congressional Quarterly, CQ. Uh, responsible for supervising coverage of public policy issues, environment, energy, ag, transport, technology, telecommunications, science, and aviation. And if there's anything left after that, I'm not sure, but certainly a lot of things that we care about here at the center. So um, <coughs> somebody who can really see, again, um, I think we'll hear about s seeing the, the broader view and uh, how some of these issues come together in ways that those of us who may be really focused in one area don't necessarily see some of those connections. So it's terrific to have these four, four guests with us. I'm going to turn the, the floor over to Louise and then just say when we will go through the presentations and we have some video clips and bear with us if we have some uh, pauses in transition between the presentations, but we'll do all of that and then we'll have a Q&A and discussion, lively discussion. We have two hours today, so we should have plenty of time. When we do do that discussion, if you could um, wait for one of my colleagues to bring you a microphone so that we capture your questions um, uh, for the online viewing audience as well. So, Louise, okay, I'll turn you. the floor over to you. Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure to speak at the Wilson Center. I'm always very excited to come here because the people in the audiences are so interesting, often very, in, um, very involved in the issues that we're looking at and actually involved in making policy. So, whenever I come, I look at the list of who's there and try to check off all the people that I would want to meet um, to talk about the issues that we do and some of the trips that, that we take. So please, I have my card here um, at the <coughs> end of the session, really. Um, uh, Jeff was very helpful when we were putting together this Uganda trip. I would call him up and ask, uh, what are some of the issues we should be looking at? Who are some of the people we should meet? Um, I should add that our next trip is going to be to Kenya. I leave there in two, week f in two weeks to do the advance work for the trip that will take place in June. So I've called uh, Jeff again, and any of you who have thoughts or know of people or of issues or of possible site visits in uh, Kenya on the issues that we're uh, primarily interested in, which are uh, health, development, environment, agriculture, and economics. Um, I'd be more than happy to uh, meet you and uh, hear about some of the uh, things that you're doing there. I wanted to start very briefly talking about what's happening in the news industry now in the United <coughs> States, and then telling you a little bit about our program. I was here several weeks ago uh, when they had the panel on science and environmental journalism, and one of the panelists, a journalist, said, the news industry these days is like Detroit. And that's really true. There's been a severe contraction due to a, a dramatic drop in advertising that was already happening due to migration of advertisers to the web and the changing business model of um, journalism. It's been very much um, uh, accentuated by the economic downturn. Um, with the result, there's been this major contraction. There have been layoffs and furloughs and um, uh, wage reductions. And people are worried that even with all that, it may not be enough. What's also happened as a result is that many international news bureaus, there weren't that many to begin with. In fact, our program was started 10 years ago to deal with the decline in foreign news bureaus by American news organizations overseas. That has also dramatically dropped. And now, uh, incredibly, many news organizations are even cutting their Washington bureaus, which is kind of mind-boggling when you think you would want to know what your congressional delegation is bringing back to your state, but again, someone has to pay those journalists, someone has to pay the rent on the, um, on the bureau, so it, it's a very severe downturn. Our program was started 10 years ago to deal with this problem that has now become accentuated, the decline in uh, foreign news reporting. Um, uh, in American news organizations. Uh, in the way the, there have been very exciting transformations uh, in journalism over the past 10 years, but one of the, uh, with the web, with many more sources, you can now read 
African newspapers online or, or Asian newspapers, so you have many more sources to choose from. But one of the byproducts has been, again, pressure on the revenues of American news organizations, and one of the places they are first to cut back is uh, foreign news. So our program was created with foundation support. We now have um, the six or seven different uh, found mainstream US foundations that fund us to try to fill that gap, to try to give American journalists who are by and large um, dying for the opportunity to go overseas and learn about a whole range of issues um, from uh, refugees to human rights to all the other the issues that we look at on these gatekeeper trips but simply don't have the opportunity. Their news organizations, even some of the very large ones, don't have the budgets. Uh, sometimes it's not a priority. So we fill that gap. And uh, now, especially in the economic downturn, it's become even more important. So just very briefly, we have two major programs. One is for more junior journalists with at least three years experience. That's this program, the IRP Fellowships. We will send a journalist, an American journalist, or a foreign journalist working full time for a US news organization to any country in the world to do any project of their choice if it's a, a serious project. And we subsidize a five week reporting trip and time to prepare and do study and uh, meet people like Jeff and then time to write up um, their results when they return. For more senior uh, editors who are supervising editors who are decision makers in the newsroom, um, uh, my colleagues here, uh, we have something we call the gatekeeper editor trips. All these brochures are also um, outside. Um, where uh, time is very precious for uh, senior editors. They're very busy in the newsroom. They're running <coughs> the newsroom, so we take them out for a 10-day to two-week uh, trip in a country that's undercovered in the news. Um, the, our Kenya trip, which is coming up, will be our 11th trip, I think. Um, last year, we went to Uganda and Turkey. We've gone to Nigeria. We've gone to South Africa. Uh, we've gone to Brazil. And um, we've gone to Indonesia, a range of other countries. For, we've gone to Syria and Lebanon and Egypt as well. And, uh, what, and often on these trips, it's the first experience on that continent, the first time to Africa for many of the editors, the first time to the Middle East, um, even though the US has had a, a long involvement there. Sometimes, you know, again, there's just not the opportunity. We put together a program for them. Our um, emphases have been health development, environment, uh, economy and, and agriculture. And we find that through those topics, we get to a lot of the other issues, whether it be certain political conflicts or democracy issues. But those are really the bedrock issues that every citizen in that country cares about and is affected by. So um, I, uh, sometimes we put, we had a, a Korea trip um, recently. We put together a compilation of the reporting that comes out as a result of these trips. And our Korea trip and Egypt trip, the publications are out, uh, out in the uh, lobby. So one thing that uh, we have been interested in is seeing how much, how significant an impact these trips and these programs have had on report, uh, reporting in the US media. We recently had an independent evaluation by the University of Georgia of our programs for the past 10 years. And I'm very pleased to say that they were able to demonstrate that there was a significant uh, impact on the reporters and both on the editors, both in terms of how they approached stories and how much on, of reporting on those particular countries appeared in the media as a result of these trips. What was very interesting in the evaluation as well was that um, the fellows of the, uh, the more junior program said um, that the IRP program even changed the way they covered local issues that many said they were more likely as a result of the program uh, to propose stories about the US that involve some international dimension or comparison as a result of the fellowship. And we're very pleased with that result because as I'm sure everyone here knows that what happens in the world, even halfway around the world, has often a direct impact on the United States. And someone has to enable um, the American media to have the skills to see those connections, to make those links, and we're happy to play that role and hope in the future we can play an even bigger role. So I'm going to leave most of the talking about our Uganda trip uh, to our editors. Again, it's a country that's not extensively covered uh, in the news. It's a, a very interesting country. I think a lot of us 
found, uh, discovered a lot of things that surprised us um, about Uganda. And I want to let my colleagues do most of the talking, but I just wanted to list a couple of things that surprised me and also show a couple of clips of our meeting with President Museveni. One of the advantages of uh, these trips is when you go with a critical mass of, of 12 very senior editors is you can often get in to see the head of state. And it's often very illuminating as you go around and meet people from all walks of life to be able to speak to the head of state and see his or her <coughs> perspective on a lot of the issues that we are looking at. So um, I just wanted to list um, a couple of uh, the things that surprised me, and then maybe we'll run through all the clips. Um, first one, I uh, big surprise for me was uh, President Museveni's views on population. Um, I went in thinking African leaders saw an explosive population road, uh, growth as a problem for development. Uganda is one of the highest fertility rates in sub-Saharan Africa and one of the highest in the world. That was not the case with President Museveni. Uh, he had a very different view, and we'll see his view on the, on the clips. The other thing that I think we all experienced was um, the road network and how bad it was. It was, a, it was six hours r virtually for every spot that we wanted to go to, and the roads were in very bad condition. Um, we hadn't realized how bad, and when transportation is difficult, everything that flows from that, the effect on markets, the effect on healthcare, the effect on commerce and education. So that we had firsthand experience, and it was, it was quite illuminating. The other thing that uh, surprised us was the uh, severe lack of electricity. I knew that um, there wouldn't be electricity everywhere, but I was surprised, according at least to some of the World Bank and UN figures that I've seen, only 8 to 13% of the population in Uganda has access to electricity. So in other words, 87 to 92 percent of the population has no electricity. And the impact of that and the impact of being able to build factories and refrigerate food and, uh, you know, it goes on and on and on was quite striking. Again, one of the emphases of our program was health, and it was good. I think it was a very valuable experience for us to see the PEPFAR program that's providing AIDS um, uh, so many AIDS uh, drugs and treatment, um, to see that in action, and it was quite dramatic. Um, it was interesting to see how quickly it ramped up in Uganda, very dramatically, what a massive program it is, uh, the impact that it's had on health services, and we visited rural health uh, clinics, and also the sharp dividing line in care between <laughs> illnesses that fell under the PEPFAR um, umbrella and illnesses that did not, and how those were treated and the difference uh, in both facilities and, um, and, and treatment. And finally, um, I was also surprised uh, in Uganda to see how many children were going to school. Uh, we took these long drives to rural areas um, in the countryside, and all along the road in brightly colored clothing, there were thousands and thousands of children. They were barefoot. Some of them were walking for kilometers, but they were going to school. And it was very striking to see that in some of the countries that we visited, that's not the case. So with that, I'll stop, and maybe we could roll the um, Museveni clips. The first one's on population, the second one on environment, and the third one on circumcision as a preventative for AIDS. You can see his You can views. fit India into Africa 11 times. Population. And yet, even today, when the population has somewhat I increased, still the population of the whole of Africa is smaller than the population of India. <coughs> Therefore, the, po the problem of Africa is not population. Please. It's not population. It is underdevelopment. And to some extent, even that uh, underdevelopment is caused by <coughs> underpopulation. Underpopulation itself is a, a factor of underdevelopment. For instance, the phenomenon of exporting raw materials instead of exporting finished products. That is the biggest problem, not population. By, for instance, Uganda exporting uh, unprocessed coffee, for which we get one dollar per kilogram. This coffee is taken to UK, 
way it is processed by a company, a company called Nessim into finished coffee. And for, them, for their effort, they get about $20 per kilogram. Now, by sorting that one out, the economy of Uganda can go up by a factor of 10. Category number one is pollution due to greed. The second now the pollution is in two categories. Category number one is pollution due to greed. The second category is pollution due to lack of resources. You see, for instance, like in Africa, the biggest uh, damage to the environment is the lack of electricity. If you don't have electricity, then how would you stop peasants cutting trees to use them as firewood, uh, as uh, biomass fuel? In the case of Uganda here, th th these, these peasants are destroying something like uh, 40, 40 billion cubic meters of wood per annum in firewood. Now, that is environmental damage due to uh, need, to, to uh, acute need. The last one is on uh, circumcision and HIV AIDS. Where has that uh, circumcision worked? I, I want to know. Because we've got tribes here which circumcise, uh, and they get AIDS. I'm not against th that uh, thing, but let me study the science first. Let, let me know how a human body becomes armored through circumcision. Then if I'm convinced, uh, then I will <laughs> go along. But I will not study it uh, deeply. But did, the, did ABC work? It worked because it brought uh, infection from 18% uh, to 5%. I, 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 prevalence, prevalence, not infection, prevalence. Uh, now it's beginning to go up again because of the relax relaxation on the missing. Or oh, ABC, this, this was abstin abstinence, uh, being faithful to each other, or if you can't use using condom. But condom as a, a last resort, not as the way of life. Again, I should add that uh, Ben here shot that interview with uh, that meeting with the president. Hi, uh, I'm Paul Hendrick from Congressional Quarterly here in Washington. And uh, first of all, I want to thank the Wilson Center for organizing this event and especially thank Louise for her great work in organizing the trip. Um, it really was an incredible amount of um, uh, experiences in a very short period of time and, and a very eye-opening trip. Um, I just to sort of, I, I want to talk a little bit about a story that I came back and wrote about, which is I think is a little bit of a case study in, in the kind of story that my publication, CQ, would never have done um, were it not for this trip. Um, and it, it, it sort of reinforces the value of, of these, these uh, trips that Louise spoke about. Um, but first of all, just more generally, um, in terms of the value of the trip, a, a lot of it, a lot of it um, comes across in more subtle ways. I think it's it's not necessarily just the the, the, the big story that's done about the trip, but um, a lot of the value of this trip comes about in the decisions you make as an editor on an on an ongoing basis. Um, for example, at CQ, we we generally don't do much in terms of covering foreign news. We're we're very much uh, focused on on the U.S. Congress in particular and a little bit beyond that on, on U.S. Um, policy, public policy agencies. So we don't generally do a lot of foreign news except as it relates to Congress. 
um, and probably don't do enough of it. Um, and so our mindset isn't, isn't thinking necessarily about um, what's going on out there in the, the rest of the world. We're very much focused on you know, this particular bill that's being marked up in committee that day or this particular vote on the Senate floor. And you, you can kind of get a tunnel vision. And I think, I think a, an important value of this trip is to sort of, is sort of see and sort of think about how these, these things that we deal with in Washington every day um, have a real impact in the real world. Uh, you make that connection to, to what's going on out there. So um, I, I thought that was a valuable experience. And a couple quick examples. Um, we, my, my team of reporters, one of our reporters covered the, um, the, the U.S. Farm Bill last year, the uh, reauthorization of farm policy, um, most of which um, our focus is on, obviously, domestic concerns, um, commodities, um, subsidies, things like that. But as a, as a result of my going on this trip, I think I was more aware <laughs> in terms of making sure that our coverage also included um, the issues of trade, the issues of, of um, nutrition aid to um, you know, to foreign countries, the, the dispute about whether in, in terms of providing food to, to, uh, to countries suffering from starvation, whether the food should be bought regionally or whether it should be provided by, from the U.S. This is a, a very big debate. So I think that's an example of how, in a very subtle way, being on this trip helped me to look at this issue a little bit differently and shape our coverage a little differently. I think likewise, that'll probably come into play this year as Congress debates a climate change bill, which again, we'll be focusing a lot on the domestic concerns, the cap and trade and how it's gonna work and how it affects the US economy. But, but there's also the issue of how um, uh, carbon credits can be used um, as a tool of, of, um, of foreign assistance, for instance, how, how we saw in, in Uganda, for instance, um, we saw the deforestation that you heard President Museveni talk about, uh, but we also saw areas where the Forestry Commission was planting pine trees, pine forests, um, with money that was provided from, from, Europe, from Europe through their um, carbon credit programs. So um, I think in, in that very subtle way, it helps you think about your coverage a little bit differently and, and maybe maybe put a little bit extra texture that, that wouldn't be there if you were just um, hadn't had this kind of experience. Um, I want to talk specifically briefly about a, a story that I did for our magazine um, about um, <coughs> conflict in Uganda over the use of DDT. And what was interesting is that the genesis of this um, was uh, a meeting we had with the health ministry where we discussed, um, where they were discussing their efforts to, to stamp out malaria. And I was very struck at that meeting by kind of um, almost missionary zeal from the, from the, um, uh, from the, the people involved in the malaria program about the use of DDT. It was very, it was very striking. In fact, at one point, one of the doctors started to make a joke about Rachel Carson. He started to joke about, oh, you know, she just woke up one day and she didn't hear her favorite songbird. And then he sort of caught himself, realized, you know, this was politically incorrect, and then sort of muttered, well, of course, she was probably right at the time. But um, there was kind of an attitude there, a, a real, a real gung-ho spirit. And um, so that's what got me thinking about the idea. And then the, the last day of the trip, I picked up one of the newspapers, and there was a story that, um, a, a group of organic farm exporters and producers were preparing to file a lawsuit to block the use of um, DDT in spraying in the northern part of the country. And um, so I decided to follow up on this when I came home. Eventually they did file the suit and, and the spraying was stopped. What was kind of interesting, um, do I just push this to advance it? There we go, okay. Um, what was kind of interesting is that, um, when you think about it, is that in the, in the West, DDT was, was, the reason it got banned was its overuse. I can full screen. So oh, thank you. Can read it oh, good, okay. Um, the, um, the reason DDT eventually was banned was its overuse in agriculture. Um, <coughs> as one expert put it to me, farmers love DDT because it kills everything. And that's why it was so popular and, and which led to it being banned. It's kind of ironic then that in Uganda now today, and um, the, the fight against the use of DDT is not being so much led by environmentalists as by uh, farmers, and specifically organic farmers. Um, so, so that struck me as an interesting sort of insight that I don't think I would have would have occurred to me without having been on this trip. Um, 
yeah. as you see, the health ministry is real gung ho to use DDT, and, and organic um, agriculture producers are afraid it'll contaminate their products and, and kind of stamp out their growing industry. Um, of course, the, the whole ban on DDT sprung from Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring, um, led to the U.S. ban on DDT in 1972. Which, what was interesting, though, um, Silent Spring was credited with giving birth to the environmental movement, but it also really gave birth to the organic farm movement at the same time, as, as people wanted to, um, to buy products that were free from chemicals and they thought they were um, healthier for, for, for um, for the consumer and more sustainable for the for the environment. There's of course a great deal of debate about the value of organic farming, and, and um, but in any case, um, this this book sort of gave gave rise to this movement as well, and it, they both kind of converged on this um, this issue that's playing out right now in Uganda. Um, malaria, of course, in Uganda is a, is a very big problem, and and I think. We knew that, I think we all knew that when we went there, um, and I had to take our, our medicine before we went to Uganda, but, I, but I, I don't think the scale of it really came home to me until, until I was there. Um, it, it, the country has the most reported malaria cases in the world. It's the leading cause of death and illness, um, huge strain on the, on the health system. Um, greatest burden is on young children and pregnant women, um, an African child, um, dies from malaria every 30 seconds, and 80% of the world's malaria deaths occur in, in, Afri in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, beyond this, it's also a real strain on the economy when you think about it, because um, obviously people who are suffering from malaria, if the farmer's suffering from malaria, he's not out there harvesting the crop, and a child who's got malaria isn't going to school. So even beyond these statistics, malaria takes a toll on the economy in ways that we might not think about. And so it's a huge problem, obviously. And um, in terms of trying to fight the spread of malaria, the two tools that, that are, tend to be effective are the use of bed nets treated with insecticides and then indoor residual spraying of homes to kill mosquitoes um, that spread the malaria. Um, and as you can see, the, um, the head of the, the malaria control program told us during our interview that if, if he could get 17 million nets, if he could get a spraying, he predicted he could stamp out malaria in Uganda within five years. Um, that may be optimistic, but it's, um, it's certainly, um, again, it sort, of, it sort of reflects that missionary aspect that, I, that we saw. Um, there are 12 different um, insecticides approved for use in indoor residual spraying. DDT is one of them. Um, effectively, they're used in a rotation. Um, or in areas where one particular insecticide hasn't developed um, resistance. Um, advantages to DDT is, is it tends to be long lasting. When you spray it on there, it stays on the walls for a long time. Um, a lot of experts say it can repel the mosquitoes as well as kill them, so it has an ad added value that way. And it costs less than a lot of the alternatives, which is, of course, an important concern in, in Africa, where um, at the these are poor countries. Um, concerns, of course, it accumulates in the environment and it has a long-term toxicity. And then there's a lot of debate about how, how carcinogenic it, it really is. Um, in Uganda, they started a spraying program last spring. Um, USAID, through the President's Malaria Initiative, um, funded this program or helped fund it. Um, for, for me at CQ, this was sort of our way into the story because our focus is on U.S. policy, and this gave us a reason to write about it. Um, the spraying was shut down in June when a court ruled for the organic farmers who were concerned the products would be compromised. Um, agriculture, of course, is a big, the, the biggest um, industry in Uganda, employs 85 percent of the population, um, mostly small farmers, mostly poor, mostly organic farmers de facto just because they don't have access or, or the money to buy a lot of fertilizers. Um, but in Uganda, they've kind of turned that to their advantage to a certain extent. It's, um, um, Uganda has, has developed a, an industry, a fledgling industry of certified organic farmers. They're, they're um, the leading organic exporter in Africa um, and uh, 13th in the world. Um, it's a growing industry. Um, the advantage for farmers is, of course, that they can, um, they can sell these products at a premium. Um, and so, so this is a growing industry, and of course, um, the concern is that if traces of DDT are found in these products, um, 
they'll be shut out of markets, especially in Europe, their biggest market. Um, EU officials, in fact, have told Uganda that uh, you better be careful because if we find DDT in your products, um, you're not going to get in. And uh, in fact, um, there's a company, a Dutch company called Bo Weevil that, that um, ran a program in northern Uganda to, to produce cotton and, and at the same time to train farmers in sustainable agricultural practices uh, to raise other crops, beans and things like that. And uh, just last year, they refused to take the crop of cotton because they were concerned that it would turn out not to be certified, they would not be able to get it certified as organic or if down the line their products were found to have DDT in them, it could lead to the demise of their whole operation. So this is a very real um, problem in Uganda. It's a, it's a very, it's a, it's a very, it's an ongoing conflict. Um, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting one, I think, because it, it sort of pits two very worthy causes in a sense against each other, um, uh, eradicating malaria on one hand and helping develop this, this new industry to, to, help, um, to help this poor country grow. Um, and uh, and this, is the, this is an example, again, of the kind of, kind of story that um, you only get by, by visiting a place and meeting people and, and, and having, having these kinds of experiences. So um, it, was, it was a great experience. And, and uh, again, Louise and, and, and IRP did a fabulous job of organizing this. And, and um, I think the only frustration is I know there are so many more stories to be told there. And, and hopefully, um, people will have the opportunity to do that. So thank you. I'm uh, David Rocks. I'm from Business Week magazine. I think I come f uh, to this from a slightly different perspective uh, than a number of the other people who were on the program. One is my job is I'm basically the foreign editor, so uh, everything I do is global. My, my job is to make sure that we get enough global news into the magazine. Uh, but I have to say that for us, Africa is a quite undercovered uh, place. And then also, <coughs> I would say that my perspective in terms of the stories I was interested in were, was significantly different from th that of most of the other people because I wanted to find out what's going on there in terms of economics and business. And, <coughs> and uh, on one level, you could say not much. I, was, um, I, I had lunch with somebody from the Ugandan consulate before I left, and I said, well, what's, what's the biggest factory in Uganda? I thought, you know, maybe I'll go visit the biggest factory and see what, see what they do. And she said, well, I think it's Coca-Cola. <coughs> and uh, I, uh, it was just incredibly depressing for me to hear that. <coughs> but, um, but anyway, it turns out I, I did find a, a factory or two that I did get in to see. But um, I guess I would, I would say what I really wanted to find out about the place was what makes the economy tick. What, in, an, in an economy like this, a developing country and this was, I should say, my first trip to Africa. What is it that that moves that, that moves people that that moves uh, that, that that makes the economy grow? And and as Paul has pointed out, it is largely agrarian. But there are there are certain initiatives that that people have that that are creating a certain amount of of commerce um, and and industry. And so I, I was able to get there and 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 see some of these things. I visited a, uh, a pharmaceutical factory, which, uh, you know, it could have been in northern Virginia uh, in terms of its level of sophistication and everything, but it was uh, sort of plunked down there like a spaceship in, in the middle of, of Uganda in, in, a, in a strange way. It was, it was run by, a, by an Indian company, which had set it up because of a, um, because the, there's a, there's a, uh, because of WTO rules, there's a rule called TRIPS, and I can't remember what it stands for, but this, uh, these regulations have largely banned most countries from, uh, from copying patented drugs, and, but what are called least developed countries have the opportunity to not follow the, those rules for some number of years. India is on the wrong side of that divide, so they had to get rid of all of their uh, their non-patented drug production, or their, their patented drug production. And so their, this company moved its factory to Uganda, uh, which was, it was pretty interesting. And it's, it showed the kind of development. Now I got, uh, I think this is one of the stories that Louise might have put out there. I got a number of nasty comments from people online saying, you know, well, intellectual property is important and you have to, 
you have to maintain the the uh, the integrity of, of people's in intellectual property and everything, and and I I don't disagree with that, but I also think that they're in a country like Uganda where AIDS and malaria are huge problems, that if they they can have an ability to get drugs in at a much lower cost than importing them, I can't say that that's a bad thing either. Um, <clears throat> another really interesting story that I fell upon, which I don't think uh, Louise put out there, but I was. Um, we spent an ungodly amount of time in in this bus, driving around <coughs> the the roads that that Louise um, described as not very good is one of the great understatements of all time. Uh, the, what, the the road that, that just about killed me was um, they, they had finished the the road surface uh, apparently four years before we got on the road, but. They hadn't actually, they, they, they'd kind of created the, the road, but they hadn't paved it yet. So in order to keep people from driving too fast on the road, this is the new road, probably one of the best roads in Uganda, they put speed bumps about every 20 meters for, a f for 40 kilometers. And so uh, you can't imagine, it was just, it was unbelievable. But anyway, uh, th that's an aside. One of, the, one of the things that I was struck by was um, the advertising in Uganda. The, the cell phone networks are, are huge, and they've taken over, uh, th they paint all of the buildings, uh, especially out in the villages. So they're painted with the logos of the cell phone companies and, and other companies. And one of the companies that struck me was Kiwi Shoe Polish. And, I, and I, you know, if you look at my shoes, you'll see that I don't spend a lot of time <coughs> polishing my shoes. And I thought, why on earth are they advertising Kiwi shoe polish? And it wasn't just one. There were like, you know, 10 or 15 of these buildings that are painted with the, in the Kiwi shoe polish colors. And so I finally found uh, the company that imports, Kiwi, that imports Kiwi. It's Sara Lee, the same people who make the coffee cake and all that. Um, and so I talked to them and I said, you know, why do you, why do you advertise Kiwi shoe polish? And the guy said, well, in Africa, you know, you buy one pair of shoes and you use it. You use your shoes until they really, you know, for 10 or 15 years. So you have to keep them shined and polished and, and, and in good shape in order to, to, to use them, uh, which made a lot of sense. But, he, but then he said, but, you know, that, that's not the story. What's the story really is that we, our sales have gone down by 50% in the past year or past two or three years. I said, well, why is that? He said, well, because the Chinese companies are – counterfeiting our shoe polish. And so I found that, you know, these little tens that they sell for literally 15 or 20 cents of shoe polish. Somebody in China has figured out that they can make money counterfeiting it, getting it into Uganda, and selling it. And so uh, literally somewhere about 40% of the Kiwi shoe polish that's sold in Uganda is counterfeit. And I mean, it's and, and, and it's you know it's it's funny and, and you laugh and I certainly did too. But it's also a tragedy. Sorry, they sell it cheaper. They sell it a little bit cheaper, yeah. Um, but uh, but not not so much actually. It's not because the the consumers don't know that it's fake. So they're getting, according to Sarah Lee, an inferior product. I can't say whether you know it actually is inferior or not, but it probably is on some level. And they're paying full price for it. And, and they're getting ripped off. You know, so th it's the poorest of the poor who are getting ripped off. And then I found another guy, um, the Nice Plastics Company, uh, this, this guy who makes toothbrushes. He claimed to be the first toothbrush manufacturer in, in Africa. And, uh, and he sells his toothbrushes for an, a dime a piece. And somebody in China, and he sells them in three countries, in Rwanda, Rwanda Burundi, and, um, and uh, in Uganda. And he said, somebody in China is counterfeiting my toothbrushes, matching my packaging, getting them into Uganda, and selling them. And you know, th a third of the nice toothbrushes that are sold in Uganda are fakes from China. And he showed me the packaging. I couldn't, you know, he, once he pointed it out to me, I could tell the difference between the two. But if I were faced with a, an, a, a display of toothbrushes in the store, I certainly wouldn't know. And uh, you know, this is devastating to, to an economy. And so it was just, to me, it was just a real eye-opener that uh, there appears to be no bottom to, the, to where, where the counterfeiters will go in terms of, uh, in, in terms of their, uh, their activities. So 
it, that, that was a, a real eye-opener to me. Um, <clears throat> I guess uh, they gave us a, a few questions that they wanted us to answer, and I'll just run through them fairly quickly. But um, I would say that uh, I was asked, how did this change my reporting and editing? For one thing, I, I mean, I personally wrote, I think, four or five stories while I was there. And then I also commissioned a couple of stories from from my reporters, my, my Frankfurt bureau chief. I was on the phone with him a couple months after I got back, and I said, you know, one thing that I noticed while I was there is that a lot of the, the, the um, there's some Pizza Hut type chain in the, in the supermarket, and a number of businesses there, the banks, they all seem to be South African. And so I said, well, you know, what is it about the South Africans? Why don't, why don't you go down to South Africa and look around and, and tell me, are they as dominant across sub-Saharan Africa as they appear to be in, in Uganda? And so he went down there, and, and he did a very nice story about two, three months ago that, that looked at that. And he, and he concluded that, that they are very successful in large part because in South Africa they, um, they have, they're, they're used to dealing in a very constrained, very difficult environment, which by any definition sub-Saharan Africa is. And therefore they've, they've kind of developed the management chops, as it were, to uh, to be able to operate in these kind of environments, and so, so uh, yet another story that was spurred directly by by the fact that I went on this trip, um, and then I guess the the last thing was, you know, what are the most underreported stories you encountered? Uh, to some extent, Africa is underreported, of course, severely, but and I would say business stories about Africa, um, it's. People go there and they write about wars and, and poverty and, and disease and, and, and all of the things that, that we know about in Africa, and those are perfectly legitimate stories and they should be written. But underpinning a lot of those problems is, is economics. And, and so I think that there is a lot of room for interesting economic and business stories to be done from Africa, and I hope to get my people to do more and more of that. So thank you. I just want to mention that uh, David's stories and Paul's stories are um, on the back table there, several examples of what they did from the trip. Good afternoon. I'm Ben De La Cruz with the Washington Post. Um, this was my first trip to Africa as well. And I went uh, as a producer, uh, video producer, and reporter for the Post. The um, focus of, of my uh, reporting was basically on security issues in the north, in uh, the Gulu region, where there's been a 20-year civil war. At the time when we went last year, there was a ceasefire that already was going on for two years. And I was interested in what was going on in the camps and also, because there was a ceasefire, what effect that had on recovery, reconciliation, and those types of issues. But in the, in the course of doing that, I also wanted to look at food and health, health issues as it related to this recovery process. So I went into the camps in Uganda. And my goal was really to humanize these stories by finding strong characters, which is, which is you know, the most effective way that we do that for documentaries. You know, we can't have people talking all the time. So we wanted to, I wanted to find, with the help of our local guide, Sam Guma, who the International Reporting Project found, Louise actually found, who was an incredible help to us. And he was actually our guide during the whole 10 days. So. Louise and the IRP was, are very sort of helpful in setting you up with all these contacts. The, um, and so the, the main piece that I did, I, I focused on the camps and what was going on there as it stands right now, well, at least a year ago, and also wanted to do personal stories of recovery, which I'll play for you. Um, but I also wanted to talk about um, some key facts about what's happening um, with the, with the Civil War and the security there. Um, at the height of the Civil War, there was two million people displaced. 
um, 66,000 people between the ages of 14 and 30 were abducted by the Lord's Resistance Army, which is headed by um, sort of a madman cult, cult figure named Joseph Kony, who I'm sure people who are study Africa know very well. And he's responsible for many atrocities and is um, an, a warrant has been issued by the ICC for his arrest. Um, but the most surprising thing I discovered um, it, going in the camps was the, was this, despite the two years of, of relative peace, um, lots of people are still living in the camps and are afraid to leave. There's a huge fear factor because of Joseph Kony's rebels. They, even though they had a ceasefire, they were always afraid he's gonna come back. Until this day, he still hasn't signed a ceasefire. And DR Congo, um, Southern Sudan, and Uganda have now put together a joint military force to try to, try to combat the LRA rebels, um, which I think are in, um, are they in Congo right now? In, yeah, they just had a spectacularly unsuccessful right, attempt with, at doing that. Right, and the US, <coughs> the U.S. was involved in helping train, train, train some of these troops, but again, uh, Joseph Kony and the rebels escaped. And this has been going on for 20 years. Um, but the most surprising thing I discovered in the camps was, besides even the fear, was that the incredible lack of um, food and health care in the camps, which is contributing to, according to some estimates, actually this was a, a World Health Organization estimate, that 1,000 people were still dying in the camps. And that was a 2005 study that was jointly released with the Ugandan government. And when I was in the camp itself, um, I witnessed you know, a little baby girl who you see in the, in the video that I'll play who was being treated for malaria, very curable. I mean, some sort of malaria. They don't really know diarrhea, malaria, which is a common problem in the camps and around the Gulu region because healthcare is so poor. And, you know, she, um, not to give away the uh, ending of the video, but, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't survive. Um, and regarding malnutrition, Betty Bagombe, who I interviewed for this series, who was a, um, uh, a scholar in the Africa department here, um, told me that the World Food Program they make deliveries, but they only last, the actual food that's delivered to the families only lasts for eight days. And they may only come every three months. So there's a real need for people to figure out other ways to survive besides the World Food Program and the rations that they get. And one of the ways they do it is, you know, a lot of the women, not the men, interestingly, are the ones going out in the fields and farming. And so they sort of, they're the, they're the brave risk takers and hard workers. And literally, it was uh, the women who would be out there. Then I would go back into the camp, and the, the guys were like playing cards or drinking or doing something, relaxing, while, while all this other work was going on. Um, the, um, the video that I'm going to play is called um, The Camp's A Life or Death Choice. And, you know, I guess after this, we're going to move into the Q&A, and I'll just you know, take questions as part of the whole group at that point. Camp Commander, Pavel. Can we uh, dim the lights if possible? Dave, could you leave the lights when you finish taking a picture? Or maybe? In the last two years, the bush in northern Uganda has been a serene place. Joseph Kony's rebel group, the Lord's Resistance Army, or LRA, hasn't attacked villagers in the region since signing a ceasefire in 2006. Then peace talks started to end the decades-old civil war. The relative calm has created a sense of normalcy in many communities. But change hasn't been as sweeping in the camps and smaller settlements for the nearly two million people who were displaced. In the Acholi district, which was at the heart of the fighting, increasing numbers of people are starting to head home. Though about 50% of the nearly 1.1 million people displaced here live in government-established camps. This is the case in Pabo, 
the biggest camp in the north with about 30,000 residents. <laughs> Displaced northerners here and across the region give several reasons for delaying their return home. Some don't have housing. Others point to the lack of food and water in their home villages. But the main reason people aren't returning home is fear. John Wilson Ojok is the camp commander of Pabo. They have seen the atrocities made by coin, so that thing is still, in, it's still there in their, in their brain. You see people killing his own brother, his own nephew. I think even you, if you could have seen that thing, I think you would never go back home. Joseph Kony, the religious cult leader of the LRA, has terrorized the region for 21 years. His rebel forces, estimated between 5,000 and 7,000 at the height of their power, have abducted tens of thousands of children who then serve as sex slaves, manual laborers, and killing machines. Once abducted, many are forced to mutilate and execute their family, friends, and fellow tribesmen, or be killed themselves. It is estimated that tens of thousands have died in the Civil War that started in 1987 because of northern grievances against the South. Kony has expressed a desire for peace during the recent talks. We the LRA, we want peace. But for the government and many people here, his failure to show up in April to sign a final deal proves that he really doesn't want to end the fighting. Back at the Pabo Camp Hospital, Hojok was visiting his sick eight-month-old granddaughter, Christine. She was suffering from diarrhea. <laughs> even some of my children have been killed by him. Even my said I was, I was mistreated for nothing, for doing nothing. I cannot, can I stay when Connie is still in the bush? I better stay here where I can be protected. We are, we are still living in camps. Many people are still in the camps, suffering. Destruction of lives and property is what dominates war. And in Lakoti, religious leaders, villagers, and survivors gather to remember the 58 people massacred here four years ago. Gibson Okulu, who is now local council chairman in Lakoti, escaped the attack. But he remembers many, including children, who weren't as lucky. Some are shot by gun, some are slaughtered by knife, some are thrown in the fire, and some children were also thrown in the fire. Okulu says that many people haven't left the camps because they don't trust Kony will ever sign the peace accord. Okulu favors a military solution. And if the, the, the leader of the rebel don't want to come back, the easiest way is to kill him. That is wha what I want. Retired Colonel Walter Ochora, who has traveled to the bush to meet with Kony, says that military options are now on the table after two years of talks have failed to produce a signed peace. The next step is to get Kony arrested or killed. It should be put out of action. Coin has mentioned to people very close to him that 10 of them already decided a long time ago not to come back home. A few kilometers outside of Pabo, a long line of people from the camp head to work the nearby fields. This group of women plant to sow soybean, sorghum, and rice on a leased plot. For those who choose to stay in the camps, lack of food is one of the biggest challenges. Susan Lacotte, a mother of nine, explains that most people aren't farming to sell their produce, but to supplement what many say is a meager ration from the World Food Program. Ah, uh, no, we don't sell. For us, we used to eat. If you sell it away, then hunger. Lacotte wants to return home by the end of the year but she is cautious because of what happened the last time she was there. After one year, we used to go back. Then be again, they used to begin killing, raping, just taking our kids to the bush.
As sun rises over Pabo, you can hear the Ugandan military soldiers who guard the camp singing during their morning exercises. The camps are now relatively safe from rebel attack, but residents here face exceedingly high mortality rates, according to a World Health Organization study. Children are especially vulnerable because of the poor health care services in the camps. Ojo promised to show us around the camp this morning, but when we arrived, he was busy getting ready to leave for a funeral. He told us that the little girl we visited in the camp hospital only a few days before had died. At the satellite camp where the girl's parents live, Ojo greeted friends gathered for the traditional four days of mourning. He took a seat beside his son James. A small mound of dirt beside the family hut marked the spot where the baby was buried. But uh, the sickness in this camps, it is so rampant because there is no health center. So it is very difficult for people when they, they fall sick. The World Health Organization estimated in 2005 that nearly 1,000 people die each week in the camps. The WHO study, which is disputed by the Ugandan government, found that malnutrition, AIDS, diarrhea, and malaria were the main causes of death for camp residents like the little girl. James said that he and his wife had hoped to move home with their daughter and her siblings by year's end, if there is peace. But now the family will have to make the journey without her. That was, that was the intro piece. There was two other pieces that I won't play that are more personal stories about <coughs> recovery, um, one of which was a former um, sex slave who was struggling to raise her daughter, now runs a small cafe, and her daughter is six years old, and she hasn't told her that um, her father was a f is a now deceased rebel, rebel commander. And the other one's about uh, a young man who was abducted when he was, um, I think he was 14 years old, and then he came back and found most of his family killed, and he's trying to get by as a, uh, they call them boda bodas, which are these sort of motor scooter taxi, taxi vehicles. And um, he also plays in a ethnic Acholi rock band. I don't know if you can call it a rock band. But, um, and you know, he sings about peace as a way to cope. So anyway, that, um, that, that sort of rounded out the, the personal stories. And then as I mentioned, we also did, a, I also interviewed Betty Begombe with this interactive Q&A that sort of gave context a lot to the, um, the, the relationship between the US policy and Uganda and the history of the Civil War. Terrific, and uh, I'm correct, right, Ben, that the folks can still go to WashingtonPost.com and see all of these videos and, and stories, yeah? That's right. Terrific. Good. And also, Ben shot some things for our website as well, which are on our website, www.internationalreportingproject.org. Terrific. Well, I, I think you've, you can see that both from the perspective <laughs> of um, editors and reporters and, and some reflections on the kind of program and how they, what they saw, how they brought back these insights in the, applying it to the profession and coverage uh, more broadly, but then also um, I think it's instructive to see uh, which stories, how they were told, how I think importantly for an audience like this, how they plugged into um, stories that could be told and need to be told with a U.S. connection, a U.S. context, and, and such, uh, but could then be very rich in terms of covering critical issues in other parts of the world, but have uh, these kinds of connections, something I think that many who are working overseas don't necessarily, A, appreciate the importance of that connection, or B, have a good sense of how to make them. And the malaria case in DDT is obviously one particularly connected to the foreign assistance, and Uganda is a place where there is a lot of U.S. foreign assistance being spent as an obvious one, um, and, and the kind of business and the conflict. I mean, really, some of these large macro narratives that we find ways to, to bring in and cover, and so it's terrific to have all those examples. Why don't we turn the, the floor open for q and I'll remind you that because we're webcasting it, it would be great if you could wait for uh, a colleague to come to you with a microphone, let us know who you are, 
um, and, uh, and then pose a question. And please, I emphasize a, a question because we have a lot of folks here uh, rather than a, a lengthy statement. Um, and we can uh, feel free to direct it to one of our panelists or you can just throw it open and um, we'll have at it. So Steve, why don't we start with you? Africa. Uh, and as you can look out over this audience, you see that, of course, there's many Africans and many Africanists like myself who are listening to you. It was a fascinating presentation. I congratulate you. I think the IRP is doing some very good work. And Jeff, I'm sorry, but I'm going to break your, your first rule and make a comment as okay. opposed to a question. No, but I, but I, I will invite a, a response back. Um, I, I certainly think it's really positive that, uh, that uh, you've had this exposure and that it's helped you to define the story uh, leads and lines and, and the ways you might approach your own reporting. But I think, and Louise referred to this in her opening remarks, I think maybe the most positive thing that can come out of this, and now I'm saying this as a non-African who has spent uh, most of his life on the continent, uh, I think the most positive thing that can come out of this is a realization that there is a very different perspective out there than what is towards events and uh, 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 than, than what prevails here in the United States. Um, I'm struck by Paul's uh, 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 exposition there on the D DDT argument, for instance. Um, but that illustrates uh, in part what I'm talking about. There's not only the two sides that you identify, that is the, the farmers who, uh, who find that without the DDT they have a more sellable product, and those who are working in the health uh, sphere who find that with the DDT they can manage the malaria control better. But there's also a perception on the part of Africans that DDT was amongst those many, many other products and drugs and things like uh, non-filtered cigarettes and whatever have you that have been dumped on Africa over the years as they were banned here. Africans are very, very sensitive to outside inf interference, have, have seen this as the Western world manipulating them for many, many years. Uh, it's, it's part of the first uh, phase of reaction to, uh, by Africans to AFRICOM when it was introduced, and I could go on and on and on about, about African perceptions and how we never understand those, and we're always surprised how they don't see it in their own good as we see it in their own good for them to do these things, have AFRICOM, uh, to, to, to use DDT, and et cetera. So I hope that Part of what uh, you've come out of this with is, is a real sense of, of the different, you don't have to change your perspective, because our perspective remains what it is, but there are really, really different bases of perspectives that Africans judge these things on than what we as Westerners do. What was, yeah. I think what was uh, somewhat interesting with, with the, the DDT question is that um, you sort of, you've heard this argument from both sides. Um, there, there was a period when the U.S. Um, wasn't supporting the use of DDT and a lot of, um, there was an argument made, it was an argument made a lot by conservatives in this country that um, this was a form of uh, uh, ecological imperialism, that you're denying Africa, you know, it was fine for the West, you guys, it, you know, it was fine to, to use DDT to eradicate malaria in your countries, and now you won't let Africa use that same tool. And then, of course, the other side of that argument is, well, you're, um, you're, you're using this chemical in Africa that you've deemed to be unsafe to use in your own country. So, it, so there really is that, that divide, and you hear that argument, um, you hear those arguments made on, on both sides of that, and it's, it's, a really, um, it's a really fascinating debate. Thank you very much. Julia Clonis, I'm a development economist, and actually I spent two years in Uganda managing an environmental program. My, uh, in the late 90s, President Clinton was in Uganda, and I remember at that time, there was in the news a lot of uh, discussion and presentation of the issues in Uganda. So my question has to do with the, uh, how do you select the countries and what preparation you go through in arranging the program and preparing the members of the team when they go to a, to a country? Uh, well, we give a lot of thought uh, to the countries. Uh, Africa is a very big uh, uh, priority for us because it is so undercovered uh, in the U.S. media. But we go through extensive um, 
uh, preparation, thinking about what, what that country has to offer in terms of not only the issues within that country, but how they're reflective of the region as a whole. We do go to other uh, regions of the world besides Africa. Our um, focus recently has been health development, uh, agriculture, economics, environment. Uh, so we look for um, significant developments or issues there. Then we do um, about th at least three to four months of prior research. Uh, I go out on an advanced trip. Uh, then we put together packets for the editors with extensive background materials to prepare them for the, um, the itineraries, which are very detailed. Uh, that we put together. We tried to get all different levels of society, so we're seeing the heads of state, but we'll also have, uh, we'll go into uh, villages, we'll go have, uh, <coughs> often have dinners with ordinary families who are talking about the things uh, that are on their minds. So everyone has a lot of reading material, including books and films that we recommend uh, once they've been selected to participate um, in the trip. So that's, uh, a little bit about the, uh, the preparation. Luis, do you want to say something about uh, the selection process and identification of the people so that if folks know gatekeepers that would potentially be interested, how do they do that? <laughs> Uh, yes, well, first go to our uh, website if you know of someone who might uh, be interested. It's uh, www.internationalreportingproject.org, and then on the left side, there's uh, a bar for, uh, on the task bar, there's gatekeeper editor's application. We've just announced recently the Kenya trip, so the application for that trip is up. The requirements for that, uh, for this particular program, is that the editors have to have at least seven years' experience, and they have to be in a supervisory position, which means they supervised staff. Um, and we uh, give some thought to having a geographical representation. We want editors from all over the United States and from all different media. So we try to get different regions of the country and uh, television, online, radio, newspapers, magazines, um, those sorts of things. We provide, in the background materials, we provide links to different international organizations. We hook up with different international organizations uh, in the countries. One of the institutions we're that I'll be stopping in uh, to meet when I'm in Kenya is the UN, UN Environment Program. We look at what, uh, where the most significant uh, health research is going on and which communities, and we give all of those resources to the editors, and then after the trip, we give them a detailed list of contacts of people, both that we've met, that they can follow up with and continue to use at resources, and people that we could not fit in the schedule, but who are very valuable resources. So they come back with a Rolodex of, of people that they can continue to call on. I would say that before we even left, Louise provided us with something a approaching a graduate level seminar in Uganda, so. <laughs> But I do think it's interesting knowing about the more junior level position and the editor's position, whereas the more junior folks have time to come, be in residence, you arrange a series of lectures, they can work town and go and meet folks. Your editors on a kind of more time constrained basis, it's a lot of read aheads and you're not, you're getting together kind of first time on the way to the airport or some something close to that approximation. Yeah, the, uh, the ju more junior program is structured a little differently because we want to help uh, I call them junior, but a lot of times they have uh, up to five to ten years experience and are, and are quite distinguished already, but have not had the opportunity, the funds, the time to go and uh, do reporting overseas, especially in the developing world. We want to give them the, the opportunity to have the experience of putting together themselves, they're entirely on their own, a five-week reporting trip, find the people, deal with the logistics, which can be very daunting, uh, deal with the security situation in many countries we do send them into conflict zones if they have, uh, if we're confident that they can handle that. Although we, we don't go to Iraq, <laughs> but we go to most other. We have sent people to Afghanistan and Eritrea and and, and other places. Um, uh, <coughs> we want to give them the feeling and the capability that they can do this. That there there's a big wide world out there. That there are many interesting things. Uh, to discover and that they are capable of putting together these trips, making these decisions, and not doing it just once in our, with, with the support that we give them, but many of them go on, having done it once, to continue uh, to do it. One of our um, 
most distinguished uh, alum, uh, alumnuses who we're very proud of is uh, Steve Inskeep, who's now the um, announcer, uh, the, the anchor on uh, Morning Edition, who had not done very much international travel um, before he came to our program. We sent him to Colombia, and he went in the jungles and spoke to uh, a whole manner of people, and there was a hot conflict there, and he's gone on to do uh, a lot of excellent international reporting. Mm -hmm. I should also say, in, in an upcoming collaboration with IRP, we're going to host uh, a photography exhibit for one of the one of the fellows, David Rochkind, who's got a, a show starting here March 20th, and there'll be a reception uh, at 4 o'clock. It's uh, documenting the tuberculosis in uh, South African glo the gold mining communities. Um, some really uh, just tremendous photographs and um, some tragic circumstances, but one that really um, captures the, the challenges there. And I hope you'll pick up the notice for, for that session, uh, uh, one upcoming, trying to, again, provide an additional outlet. So please, thanks. Good. So Heather Jeff uh, attracted corporate private sectors. Now, uh, I thank you all very much for, you know, really uh, reporting on Africa because it's really not only under-reported, but it's also often overlooked by the Westerner, you know, like they don't even bring them to tra trade mission to negotiate from strengths or something. We never train them how to go to a trade meeting in, uh, you know, like uh, Uruguay or, you know, around and uh, NAFTA and all the, no, not NAFTA, I'm sorry. So <coughs> Tokyo round also before that. Yet, um, the most, um, what we call important element for not accepting product from Africa, what we call trade barrier or uh, not meeting the standard, Western standard, or so on. And <coughs> I mean, the issue you presented, we dealt with it many, many years. I work for United Nations World Bank and AID. We had those information many years back, but the problem was how to link it to report or how to bring it to the Congress, how uh, <coughs> work together in putting it on the newspaper or putting it in the Congress bill, bec because the farm bill you mentioned is one of discriminative bill against developing country, particularly in Africa. And yet, year after year, we go subsidize the farmer in the United States. The poor farmer in Africa pay for it. So I'm glad you bring in those issues, which is we've been you know, seeing it and not able to bring it to a um, <coughs> realization or attention to our policymaker or leadership. Uh, <coughs> there is a Whitaker group, I don't know whether anybody know about them, and they were uh, w led by Rosa Whitaker, who worked with many congressmen and senators to give bilateral trade with African nation, provided they are democratic. So I would also look in this in detail. Mm, the other issue there is, uh, <coughs> last year we went to Tanzania with a uh, <coughs> group of African going to Africa to realize certain uh, business and so on. And one common business in all African countries, tourism. And, you know, like you don't need industry, but the road is one of the things that really is important. And Kenya is one of the most pro produced flower and horticulture, compete with Netherlands, and it's been an issue between Netherlands and Kenya, both back and forth. So there are a lot of work, but unfortunately it's not carried and I thank you for bringing that to all their attention. But how can we work with you? Um, I think this might be an opportunity. I'd like uh, maybe the editors could address it. Uh, journalists are a, a particular breed, and they have particular constraints that they work under and needs in order to use information in a way that's useful th to them. So I'm wondering maybe if David and Paul can say a word or two about what kind of information you get from multinational organizations or from the US government that's useful 
useful and what maybe some of the things that are, are not as useful and what form does it come in in the way that, it, that you can make use of it right. for the stories you do? Well, most, most, of, uh, most of the things we cover tend to be domestic oriented and, and that's, that's why I say being able to, um, to take a different view is a valuable thing. Um, uh, my reporters tend to work on Capitol Hill, so most of their ongoing relationships and sources are with uh, members of Congress, congressional staff, um, lobbyists, and, and sort of the interest groups in the areas they, they work, they, they focus on. Um, I guess um, it's, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I guess, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're always looking for new, um, new voices for a story, new, new points of view. And um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess just, oh, mm -hmm. okay. I just want to remind, we got lots of questions, so we want, let's give these guys a chance to yeah. respond and then go. Yeah. Uh, I, I would just, if, in terms of what we're looking for, one thing that we're generally not looking for is press releases. When, what we are looking for is access. Um, you know, my job is is two things. It's providing information, but it's also telling stories. And so I'm I'm less interested in. You know, I want information, but I d generally don't want the information that people want to tell me. I want other information, and that involves digging and asking and probing, and so what people can give me is access to the people who actually know the information that I want and not trying to give me information that I'm not that interested in. Uh, it's, it's, it's a subtle point, but I think that it's important to understand. So. Okay, why don't we work, work this side of the aisle, these two? Kaylee, bring them. this working? Yep. Um, yes, my name is Eve Ferguson. I'm reference librarian uh, in the African section of the Library of Congress and also um, a freelance journalist who recently uh, the magazine I wrote for folded completely after 12 years. Um, I, my question is for Ben de la Cruz because um, while there was a lot of concern earlier in northern Uganda about the kidnapping of children for use in Joseph Kony's army, um, a lot of the newspapers I've read recently coming out of Uganda and focusing on northern Uganda, talk about another type of kidnapping um, in which a lot of children are being kidnapped for ritual use um, and they are killed and mutilated uh, and uh, their body parts are used in protection shrines for people who are uh, attempting to protect themselves from different things going on, conflicts. I wanted to find out if you uh, heard anything about that while you were there and um, what, what the reaction of the people. I think we did hear some of that while we were there. Um, I mean, I didn't follow up on that, but that was like we. I mean, I don't. I don't remember exactly uh, when we were on a one of our trips. There's a uh, someone who told us. I don't remember who. Uh, we were going to a remote vi uh, fishing village in southwest Uganda, and the roads were very bad, and a lot of trucks and cars got stuck, so we had to get out of our uh, land cruisers and wait while they were trying to move the flatbed trucks that were up, you know, up to their axles in mud, and we saw a group of um, a women, a, a woman and a group of children going into uh, the forest to look for firewood, you know, what President Museveni was talking about. And they said they were, uh, they were going as a group because they were worried about um, these sorts of situations. We weren't able to find out any more than what they told us, but that was, that was and one and issue. And they did time it popped up. I'm sorry. And they did say that um, one reason that they may not want to be circumcised is because they, um, and this is just based on one person's um, story, that they didn't want to be circumcised because the people who were using these um, kids for ritualistic killing didn't want any blemishes on the, any like scars or anything like that for on the on the children so I mean but this is like I said based on one person's account I didn't really follow up on it Steve has the Africa program had sessions that get into the, the details of some of these issues uh, not very specifically. Okay. okay but I should uh, 
say as I did up front that the programs, they're kind of um, regional and cross-cutting programs often collaborating here, but be sure to sign up if you're interested in these issues in the Africa program, full set of meetings that cover a lot of these same topics. So, sir, please. Uh, my name is Nuruddin Sati. I am a senior scholar of the uh, African program. Uh, Wilson. I come from Sudan. Um, well, um, I would like really to commend this initiative. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good initiative. Uh, now, uh, my concern would be um, to ensure the sustainability of the, of, the, of the work that you are doing. Once you leave a country, what do you leave behind? What kind of linkages you have with the local media? Uh, whether there is a network that you create so that you will uh, ensure some kind of permanent dialogue between you and, and the local media or, or some of the, the local actors. Uh, it might be interesting to, to try and, and extend this to, to become not only a North American network, but a North American African network. So there will be a kind of partnership that you can build upon. Uh, the first, uh, my other issue is uh, concerning the um, conflict. Uh, I am very happy because you uh, you mentioned the importance of the link between underdevelopment and, uh, and conflict. Uh, usually reporting about Africa, people talk about the conflict part, but the, the underdevelopment and unemployment part is, is neglected, so I, I find this extremely interesting. Um, the question that I would like to, to ask is uh, concerns the, um, the, uh, the your own uh, observations. You have spoken about the bad roads, of course, we know that in, in Africa. But what would you like to say about the issue of electricity, for example? Um, I have been to Uganda many times, and I come from Sudan. I have been working in that region for the last 12 years. Uh, my own comment is this discrepancy, huge discrepancy between the capitals on one side. You see Kampala, how Kampala has grown in the last 10 years, how Dar es Salaam has grown, how Addis Ababa has grown, how Khartoum has grown. 20, 30 times, but the countryside is completely neglected. So uh, if you have electricity out of the 8%, 10%, maybe about 7% would be in Kampala or would be in Khartoum or et cetera. So I just want to, to hear your views on this. Concerning the issue of, of, uh, of uh, aid, um, uh, well, Mr. Henry uh, mentioned the issue that uh, as a matter of policy, uh, buying cereals uh, from the local market or continue the policy that has been going on for, for uh, ten decade, five decades now. Uh, I know that the WFP has a policy now, as a matter of policy, buying cereals on the local markets. Uh, what would you comment on this? Do you have any views on this? Or? Um. I, I believe, if, if I'm not mistaken, I believe in the Farm Bill there may have been a pilot program to, to do on a very small scale to, to do some of this. I, I don't. Re I remember that was debated, and I'm, I'm trying to remember if that. I, I believe that made it into the final, the final bill. Um, but but um, you know. Um, and and obviously there's a lot there's a lot of good reasons to do that because not then not only are you providing the food but you're providing jobs and you're providing economic development where they're most needed um, so so it's kind of a win-win situation there um, the, the the problem that uh, we run into here is that of course the the, the farm lobby in the United States is, is very strong and the the, um, the members of Congress who represent those parts of the country are are very resistant to anything that they view as not helping American farmers, and so there's just that tension there of wanting to, um, you know, wanting to support American farmers and, and protect those markets, um, and and find new ways to sell those products. So so that's where the conflict is. But I think I think there's a there's at least beginning to be a recognition I think among among some important members of Congress that this is a this is a direction to go in, and that this is a this is a, a better way to to implement food aid. But um, certainly, there's a long way to go in terms of the U.S. getting there. I think you made many um, many interesting observations and issues. First, on the sustainability, yeah, we hope <laughs> our program will continue. We think we're playing an important role, and we'd like to do it with even great greater numbers of people. So we um, we're dependent on uh, foundation grants. So that's something that you know Knockwood's been okay so far, and we hope that we'll we'll be able to to grow on the. Um, 
electricity issue, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very striking that all the electricity resources seem to be um, concentrated in the capital, which why, again, in turn, why you see this tremendous urban migration, not only in Uganda, but also in other parts. And I tell you, if you've never been, we went to villages that have no electricity, and if you see the kinds of hardships that they have to go through in, in every way from, um, from planting to preserving uh, food to, um, to getting it to market, you can see why people are leaving the villages to go and why the jobs are in the cities and not in the countryside. Um, one of the issues that uh, Jeff had asked us to discuss is what stories are undercovered. I think African agriculture and the relative neglect, um, how little is invested in it by African governments and what a tremendous impact it has on everything um, is a story that is not as extensively covered uh, as, it, as it could be and as it should be because it's really Really, that and land issues are the underpinnings of so many of the conflicts that we see, of so many of the uh, internal changes, the migrations. Um, and I was uh, quite surprised, again, in Uganda, how little money there is uh, in the state budget for agriculture, where 85% of the population is um, engaged in agriculture. Uganda is one of the, I think, nine countries in Africa that's food self-sufficient. And with a little bit of investment in agriculture and better techniques, they could grow so much more uh, food than they were. We already on those bad roads, uh, there was one main road leading up to southern Sudan. There were food trucks constantly, southern Sudan, everything. And I, we spoke to farmers that had to pour their milk uh, onto the ground because they had no way to preserve it. There was no electricity, so there was no refrigeration for cooling. That, that, that milk they could have sold up in, in southern Sudan and to their neighbors. It would help the country, but you know, again, back to that uh, electricity problem. So. Well, in fact, one of the things that was striking is that, um, and I forget the exact statistics, but uh, Uganda is one of the biggest producers of bananas in the world. I mean, obviously, it's a staple of the diet there, the, the green bananas, the uh, matoki. Um, um, but one of the biggest producers of bananas in the world, and yet they export almost none. They, they're very, they export almost none because they just don't have the, in part because they don't have the infrastructure to, to, to do that. Um, also, in terms of just things that struck us, I think one th one thing that that really struck me was um, in terms of the the AIDS ex um, epidemic. Um, we all know, of course, we, we see the statistics. We know, we sort of on an intellectual basis, that this is a huge problem in Africa. Um, and in fact, Uganda was, was actually fairly progressive in terms of trying to get a handle on this early and 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 trying to. Um, confront it head on um, and, and was pretty effective in driving down the, 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 um, the rates compared to some of the other sub-Saharan African countries. But one thing that struck me was just how, how it affects e almost everybody you meet. Um, uh, I was struck that any time we would meet a family, um, people would introduce their family, and um, and this is virtually every family I met. Um, you know, they'd say, "Here's my son, and here's my daughter," blah blah blah, and then and here are my other children, and they would introduce these other children. And these other children were um, were maybe the orphaned, you know, uh, nephews or nieces, and and they were taken in by the extended family, and it was seen as. And, um, you know, in, in one sense it's a tragedy, in another sense it also speaks a great deal to the, to the way um, the, the communities there and the families really take care of each other and try to, try to take care of each other. And, and that, that was really striking to me. And then one other case on AIDS that really struck me was we went to this remote village with the, the folks from PEPFAR. And I remember meeting this, this little boy, uh, well, he was 17, and he looked about as old as my nine-year-old. And um, he, was, he had been orphaned for, I think, four years. He was living on his own, no family, uh, for the last four years in this little village. And he survived by collecting eggs and selling them to other villagers. That's, that's, all, that's what he did. That's how he scraped together a living. And, and he talked about how much he wanted to go to school and how he wanted to learn. And you could just see in his eyes the, the realization that that was never going to happen. And you think, you know, here's this, you know, this, I mean, what a, what a wasted opportunity. What a, what a you know, th this is a kid who could have been anything. You know, he, he could have been a scientist or he could have been a, 
you know, a, a politician or, or um, he, he could have been anything, and, and yet that's not going to happen. And, and it's just the tragedy that really hits home when you see that. It's a human tragedy. It's not a bunch of numbers. Just to add to that, I think it w another thing that was striking was how dedicated the Ugandans were to the idea of educating their children. They were prepared to make tremendous, tremendous sacrifices to get their children into school. And um, so, and that that was that was very interesting to see. Also, the human capital in Uganda is top rate. The doctors that we met were absolutely fabulous. I mean, world class by by any standards. We met a lot of wonderful, very smart businessmen. We had a panel looking at business and agriculture and exports. And um, and given the right tools and the right environment and the right opportunity, you know, the, it's there. It's ready to take off. But you run into these major roadblocks such as the electricity, such as the roads um, that hold them back. But they're, you know, they're, they're, ready, they're ready to go. They just need the, um, the proper environment to be able to do so. Megan? Wilson Center. Um, thanks to all the panelists. We had a session two weeks ago on the future of science and environmental journalism in the wake of the seismic changes in both the economy and in the mainstream media. How do you see those changes affecting coverage of international issues, particularly Africa? And then specifically for Ben, do you see more opportunities for online multimedia coming out or less uh, to cover international issues given these changes? Um, this is both a wonderful and a terrible time to be a journalist, uh, especially a, a business journalist. It's uh, we're kind of living through what you might call the Super Bowl of business journalism right now. <laughs> <coughs> if we only have a job at the <laughs> other end of it. Um, we, we've spent the better part of a decade at Business Week trying to move ourselves online, create more, do more stories online. About two-thirds of the, the words that we do now actually are published exclusively online. And we've got, you know, we don't, uh, unfortunately our video, we don't have a genius like Ben on staff. If, if we did, we'd be in a lot better shape. Um, so, but we are doing video, we're doing slideshows, we're doing, um, a, you know, all kinds of multimedia things. The problem is, and, 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 and there are huge opportunities, and, and you know, to, to some extent, what does online mean for international? It doesn't mean anything more or less than it does for anything else, because it's, it's just, it's like paper. It's just there, and you use it, right? Um, and you put whatever you want on it. That said, in a, in a time of constrained budgets, international tends to be one of the first things to go, um, uh, you know, for, Business Week now has more has a larger foreign staff than any other U.S. magazine, but that's not because we're growing. <laughs> it's everybody else has shrunk to be smaller than us, um, and so uh, you know, we're, we're continuing to to maintain a, a pretty strong foreign staff, but it's half what it was five or ten years ago. Uh, so uh, you know, e even even we are are facing those kind of constraints. The problem with online is that uh, you know, how do you pay for it? Uh, we've, we've put a ton of effort into creating online content and everything, but we, our, our rate card says that our, we sell a page of advertising in the magazine for $80,000. I don't kid myself that we actually get that anymore, but you know, maybe we get 50 or something like that. Uh, I don't know what the numbers are, I mean, how much they sell online ads for, but if you figure that we have about one page of ads to two page of, of content in, in the magazine, then we're getting, let's say, 25 grand a per page of produced content, right? Uh, whatever the numbers are online, it's a lot more than one story or two stories to get $25,000 of advertising. It's probably like 10 or 20. So when, when you're faced with those kind of numbers, how do you, uh, maintaining bureaus is, is a fantastically expensive thing. You know, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars per year when you add up travel expenses, salary, um, uh, communications costs, office space, all of that. How do you do that when you're selling your content at a tenth of a cent per page view? 
um, and, and nobody's really come up with an answer for that. And if you have one, see me afterwards. <laughs> but, uh, but so, uh, you know, the, the bottom line is online, I don't know that it, it creates more or less opportunity for, for international news. What it does do is create, as, as I think Louise or somebody pointed out <coughs> earlier, uh, it creates a lot of opportunity for finding news from other sources. So you don't have to go to Business Week to, to get news about what's happening in Africa. You can go straight to African newspapers. Uh, um, and, you know, and they range in quality, but, uh, but you, can, you can get a much broader range of voices. It's just a matter of, you know, will the current voices, will they continue to, to thrive? And I think generally not. I, I would agree with a lot of what David said regarding the use of online and multimedia in particular in video, which is, you know, they, the, in terms of selling ads against video, it is a higher rate, but I mean, the, the industry, f I mean, and the acceptance and usage of video still in the United States for a company like the Washington Post, which is a newspaper, people, we have a, you know, still struggle to make people find uh, get the connection between a newspaper and and video so they don't come necessarily just yet so it's still in the early stages of, of you know being accepted but I mean we're making strides but it's still I mean and I think it's a lot different than like some of the broadcasts and cable networks that have um, viewers who already come to them for visual media and it's a little harder for newspapers to do that. I think, if, if I can just say one more thing, what online does offer is um, a multiplicity of voices. You, you don't have to be a Business Week or a Washington Post to to go out there. You know, you, um, uh, Ben's equipment, whatever it is that you paid for it two, two years ago, I'm sure it costs less than half that now. And uh, it's getting remarkably inexpensive to get the equipment. If you're willing to go there and do some reporting, you can put it up on your blog and, and people will have access to it. So on, on one level, uh, online does create opportunities and possibilities that didn't exist before. The question is, uh, will people find you? Because they tend to go to places like Business Week or the Washington Post or the New York Times to, to get their news. A and B, if you're a consumer of that news, can you trust what it is? Can, uh, there, there's a certain, uh, you know, if it comes from the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, you tend to believe it. Uh, and whereas if it comes from blogger X, you question it more. And, 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 and even, you know, and, and international news probably is a lot harder to do in that kind of way than local news, because local news, you know, you are where you are, you live, you go there, you do it. It doesn't take a lot of extra money or effort to, to do that. To get to Uganda, just getting there costs a lot of money. In terms of, uh, of the, the practice of journalism, um, the web is a great resource. And, um, uh, for instance, the story I did involved a lot of reporting once I came back. Um, and, and I was able, you were able to get online, obviously, uh, documents and source material and, and publications, um, you know, right at your fingerprints, fingers, finger, um, right at your fingers. <laughs> um, you're able to get them, you know, uh, so quickly, whereas, uh, you know, in the old days, you either wouldn't have been able to get those or um, you would have had to spend, you know, weeks in, in libraries or, you know, mailing away or things like that. So, so it definitely helps the process of actually reporting the news. Um, nothing against libraries, but <laughs> by the way. <laughs> But, um, you know, just as a reporter, something that in the old days you would have to spend hours in a public records room you get in minutes now online, and it, it helps in terms of actually that part of it. And in terms of, like, explicating complex issues, sometimes, I mean, in general, multimedia can offer various ways of presenting stories. I mean, and at The Post, we're always trying to experiment with trying to get new ways of storytelling so that, um, you know, it's because people learn differently and access news differently. So and that's one of the reasons why we do multimedia in addition to print. And, you know, a lot of people told us for a long time that multimedia, you know, will differentiate our website from our print publication, which is, you know, part of a strategy of many newspapers to try to get different viewers and readers. Sean, I, th I think you have two back there, and we'll get those two maybe together and then give our panelists a chance to respond. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Samantha White. I work for the International Women's Media Foundation. We're actually about a year and a half through a four-year initiative that um, is increasing the reporting on agricultural rural, rural development and women in three African countries, Uganda being one of them. Um, when we were doing our initial report, we found that only about 4% of the stories within the local media was about agriculture, even despite the fact that it's 85% or, you know, 70% in some of the other countries of, you know, the business development there. And I wondered if, um, in doing any of your stories, any of you went to local media houses to uh, kind of collaborate with journalists there, and if so, why or why not? And also, if the program um, would ever consider kind of working with local media houses on the ground. Thanks. Okay, terrific. And before you answer that, let's just capture, I think, to Justine or... Hi, I'm Justine with the Africa program at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, you totally sort of took the question I was going to ask, but I just wanted to sort of reiterate what Neraldine Sati was asking about networking in between local level media and organizations that you had encountered in Uganda, and if you had maintained any connections between those media or have any um, plans to encourage or bolster local level media in partnerships with the work that you've been doing. Thank you. And there's one more back there, right? Yep. Okay. I'm with the Center for International Private Enterprise. We focus on economic reform, and I'm with the Africa program. Um, <clears throat> a couple quick questions. Um, one, I just first want to congratulate uh, Ben and David for their first trip to Africa. It's always great to see that happening, and hopefully you'll get back there um, many more times. Um, ben, if you had a chance to ask uh, President Museveni anything, um, his comments on the conflict in the North. Um, also, um, uh, for David and uh, Paul, um, in terms of business, I'm curious as to the Ugandans' perceptions on some of their own barriers to doing business, if that looks like maybe what the World Bank tells us are the barriers to business or what their own perceptions are, particularly with foreign and business, as you mentioned, the uh, Indian-owned um, pharmaceutical and the Chinese companies, what their perceptions are on that. Thank you. Great. Some real small questions to cap <laughs> off today. Can I say, but the local connections and then a couple of these business okay, Well, on these trips, usually we always work with an in-country partner to help set up the program. It's a very complicated and intense program, and that local partner is usually, if not always, um, a local media um, uh, house or, or organization. In Uganda, we worked with a, a group called the Uganda Radio Network, which is like an AP service uh, for radio in Uganda and had many correspondents all over the country. Wonderful people, very top quality uh, journalists. So in that sense, we do it. The primary um, mission of these programs <laughs> is to give um, U.S. editors exposure to issues and developments in in these countries like Uganda and now uh, in the spring like Kenya. So we have very limited time to work on other kinds of more extensive collaborations. But one of the wonderful things about working with an in-country partner is I don't know how many people, not only um, Ben, but also other people from our other program with the more uh, junior journalists and other people who have passed through our program and are now doing other things come to us and say, I need to go to Uganda to report on, on um, Situation X, who should I look up there? And we have, again, a, a list of resources. It's not only Uganda, but all the countries that we've gone to. And we always work with an, um, an in-country person who's a citizen of that um, country to help put together the trip. So it's built into, the, it's built into our uh, program. So um, that's the local media part. Um, so your question was barriers to to business or, or perceptions of business. I, I guess I, I I found even people who were fairly sophisticated in terms of their or, you know business people, people that I thought should be fairly sophisticated in their understanding of economics, were remarkably naive uh, in in certain cases. They. We were talking about uh, at the time, you know, the financial situation was nowhere near as bad as it is now. But they had very little understanding of of markets and and of supply and demand and and the just the things that we kind of grow up with, you know, absorbing through our skin. I guess. Um, I think that there. I, th the other th the other thing that I, I found to be a somewhat disturbing, I guess when I was there was um, what I started calling the cycle of dependency. I, uh, as you drive through Uganda, you find 
the names of every international organization. You know, the Norwegians are here, and the French are there, and and on and on and on and on and on. And um, while we were there, one of the bridges, the primary bridge over the Nile, developed cracks, and it was in danger of falling, and it needed to be repaired. And the next day in the newspaper, uh, there was a report that you know, the, the government wants to ask Japan for $75 million to, to fix the bridge. And I, I, I thought, what would life be like in a place where you always, the, the immediate reaction to any crisis or problem is to look to your rich uncle to, to bail you out? And I think that that has a has a pretty devastating effect on uh, on the people there, and uh, which uh, and I, I wouldn't say that I'm against foreign aid by any stretch of the imagination, but I found it I found this kind of knee jerk, uh, you know, oh well they'll they'll help pay for it, you know, the EU will pay for it or or the UN will pay for it or whatever. I found that a little bit disturbing, and and I wished that uh, that they would look internally more and, and, and of course have the internal resources to, to do that but uh, but that I found I think that that's probably a, a big barrier to actually getting anything done and, and then when you talk you know infrastructure issues of course are an entirely different thing as well you know just they're they're in a landlocked country where that bridge is absolutely important you know and the railroad was washed out while we were there too so there's there's a road and there's a railroad that goes that you can export goods via it goes through Kenya and if anything happens there it doesn't matter what you make in Uganda you can't sell it so we also spoke to businessmen who talked about the high uh, interest rates to getting loans to be able to grow their businesses and again back to the electricity problem if you don't have much electricity the internet there is very slow uh, it's very difficult in this day and age to do business, and they're competing with a lot of countries that have very fast internet. So, you know, again, those infrastructure problems are really slowing them down. And there's also a sense that I, I early on, I tried to pursue uh, a story related to the food crisis, and um, there were rice farmers who had been giving this new type of upland rice, and the, f and so I went to visit some of the farmers who were doing this, and. So they would s have their rice planted, and you know it was getting ready to be, um, you know, uh, the harvested. And so whole families were out there, literally throwing rocks at the birds to keep the birds from eating all the all the rice grains. And it was literally like the whole day, and like little kids would just whip these rocks at the birds. And I mean, really futile way of keeping these birds away and they and I said well what why are you doing it that way and he goes well there's no other way to do it but we believe that the US you know probably has some technology but if you could just share it with us and it struck me that you know they thought that you know their development was being hindered somehow by um, not getting the right having the right knowledge like if we could do it in the United States you know they and they could have that technology they would get out of there this little simple predicament of getting rid of birds which I don't know if we have that technology or not but it was it's, it's interesting it was an interesting sort of take on you know their you know their problem and their ability to to make a market for their for their products Paul, can you have a final word? Because I'm afraid. Yeah, the, the, the other, another aspect that we haven't talked about that, that you hear is a real impediment to, to trade and economic development is corruption. Um, and we heard that a lot. Um, and obviously, that's not unique to, to Uganda, but Uganda, I think, Transparen Transparency International does rank it way down on the list there. Of, um, and um, we heard that a lot that, um, you know, um, in fact, um, our, our host, uh, Sam, told us how. We were driving along a road, and you could see that the the right of way was wider than the actual paved road. And the difference was that so much had been siphoned off that they couldn't <laughs> pave the road the way to, to the width that they were um, planning to do so. And you know, in a, in a country that's already poor, when so much is taken off the top, it it just it just really hampers the e economy. Um, and you know, this also feeds into. The, in fact, it was a subject that. Um, President Museveni talked about it in our meeting with him. We, we asked him about it, and he had just launched a you know, very high visibility you know, crackdown on corruption. But in fact, a lot of people would say that 
um, his, at least his associates um, and his ruling party are, are, um, are, you know, recipients of a lot of this, this corruption as well. So I think you can't underestimate what a big impact that also has on, on the economic development of a country. Terrific. Well, we, we've gone, Luis, do you have a final word? No? Okay. We've gone a little bit over. I appreciate the, the patience here and because a lot, of, a lot of rich questions, certainly a lot of rich perspectives on the panel. Uh, we hope that you'll come back here uh, Friday, May, March 20th for um, the, the, uh, the tough look at the epidemic of tuberculosis in South Africa. Um, and we look forward to future collaborations with uh, the International Reporting Project and hope that you will all now um, go check out the multimedia packages and be looking at CQ and Business Week for additional international coverage uh, as we go forward. So join me in thanking our panelists, please.